I've been itching to cover the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise. I love this guy, he's my favorite character ever. He practically influenced me to be the man that I am today. So I thought it would be fun covering the classic games. Sonic 1, 2, CD, 3, and finishing this retrospective covering Sonic Origins. But before we dive into Sonic 1, let's travel back to February 12, 1990. Nintendo released Super Mario Bros. 3. The game received universal praise and became the third most sold NES game of all time. Sega took notice of Super Mario Bros. 3's success and decided to make a game that rivals Nintendo's Juggernaut. Sega already had a mascot, Alex Kidd, but his games are different. Both may be platformers, but they don't compare. It can't be a run-of-the-mill platformer, it needed an edge of something to clash against Super Mario. A competition was held inside of Sega for the design of the main protagonist. There were 200 submissions. Famously, there was a rabbit, an armadillo, and a hedgehog. We already know who won thanks to the character designer Naoto Oshima. Enter Yuji Naka. Yuji Naka has been with Sega since 1984 and had success with a game called Girls Garden, a game on Sega's other console before the Master System, the SG-1000. He also worked on many other games such as Fantasy Stars and Ghouls and Ghosts. Oshima approached Naka and pitched a fast-paced platformer, to which Naka agreed. One thing Oshima and Naka shared love for was speed. Originally, Naka wanted to make a racing game for the Sega Genesis, but he was also interested in something to compete against the Super Mario Brothers. During the 10th anniversary of the franchise, the dev team was interviewed about their history of Sonic. Here's an interview with Yuji Naka discussing his thought process of this style of game. Well, first off, congratulations for 10 years. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay then, let's start. Why did you focus on speed as your development theme? I think Super Mario Bros. is a wonderful game, but if you play it every day, you always have to start from stage 1-1, right? Once you get good and memorize the levels, you can hold down the B button and run through the stage, but even then, it takes too long. With Sonic, I wanted to shorten that time if I could. My idea was that you'd progress slowly and carefully through the stages on your first playthroughs as you learned the enemy locations, but after you got used to it, you could really zoom straight through the levels. Unfortunately, everyone who playtested it went full speed from the very beginning. Originally, the rabbit design was going to be the main character. He would use his ears to attack enemies. This concept was shelved due to it not working with the speedy nature of the game. However, Sega went back to the rabbit concept, reworked the game, and released Rystar in 1995. They went with the hedgehog and finalized his design, gave him blue fur to match the Sega logo. Red and white shoes inspired by Santa Claus, and the buckle on the shoe was inspired by Michael Jackson's shoes on the bad cover art. Now that's for the Japanese design of Sonic. For the US, we had a different design thanks to the late Greg Martin. The redesign was apparently a need to give Sonic two. Compared to the Japanese design, the American design is a bit fatter, has fatter fingers, and of course the iconic mohawk. I like both designs, I grew up with the American one, it's near and dear to my heart, but I just simply adore the Japanese design a bit more. There we have the origins of Sonic the Hedgehog. I'd love to discuss more, but based on how I write and explain things, that'll take more than an hour. I'm not good at compressing history and keeping important details. I really recommend that you read up some of the development history of the first game by yourself. It's really interesting stuff. Sonic the Hedgehog was released in North America on June 23, 1991, with a retail price of $54.95. I would have a separate section for the story, but this is an introduction to the characters to the world. Plus, the first game story has been told in many different ways at this point of, what the f*** is this? I'll be brief. Dr. Robotic has been capturing these tiny, cute animals to power his robots. Go stop him. If I haven't stated this enough, Sonic the Hedgehog is a platformer. You press either A, B, and C to jump. Holding up with a D-pad, you can look up. Holding down, crouches. And while moving, you press down, Sonic curls into a ball and rolls. You can take enemies out by either jumping on them or rolling into them. You can collect these rings to help you throughout the game. If you collect 100 rings, you receive an extra life, so be sure to collect them. When you get hit by an enemy or an object, you lose rings and they go everywhere. You can pick them up and keep trekking along. Really, all you need is one ring for your survival. So test when you explore the level, you find these monitors. These range from giving you 10 rings, a shield, species, invincibility, and an extra life. 
Sonic takes on the side score with a twist by adding physics into the mix. For example, when you run down a slope, you gain speed. When you run up a slope, you slow down. Physics don't gain shit, but it helps set it apart from the other platformers in the market at the time. The physics go hand in hand with most of the level design. Each level has two or three pathways that the player can take. The bottom path is the easiest and slowest to navigate. The middle path is faster than what most players run on. The top path is the fastest yet hardest path to stay on. The top path is usually has a bunch of obstacles that'll throw you off, but then again, you are running on the fastest path, so it's not gonna be easy. With the physics and how the stages are constructed, it makes the players want to put their pep in their step. Every time you play this game, you want to find a new path to jump on or use slopes to your advantage. Anything is possible with this gameplay structure, and you'll do anything to shut your time. You know what? It kind of feels like a racing game. You know, after you drive a course for a while, you know at the back of your head, you know which corner to break, which part of the course to shift down, and if you want to be fucking cool, where to drift. You're essentially following a line, a racing line. You essentially have to find a line in these games, which I really love, and thus increases replayability. Now, you notice that I said most of the level design. Let's talk about them. There are seven zones in the game, with the exception of the last one, each zone has three levels within them called Acts. Acts 1 and 2 will have you run to the goal post, and Act 3 will have a boss encounter at the end of the level. There are also special zones, which you can access by grabbing 50 rings and jumping to the big ring at the end of the stage. You can only enter these stages while in Act 1 or 2. With these stages, you have to navigate through a rotating maze and get the Chaos Emerald. These stages are not hard at all, I mean, shit, the last one just practically gives you the last emerald. Collect all six and you get the good ending. Watch out for these skull orbs, they'll kick you out of the stage and you have to start over. Green Hill Zone is a great introduction level and personally my favorite level in the game. It tells you the player how everything works, such as slopes, loops, enemies, and most importantly the thing that defines this game, the physics. All of this with great pacing. Marvel Zone is kind of a disappointment. It takes the decent pace of Green Hill Zone and cripples it. Marvel Hill Zone is a slog, both in pacing and in level design. Everything is trying to kill you. Pillars that crush you, spikes coming down from the ceiling, and you could potentially not see them until the last moment, then you get owned. And lastly, riding these slow ass blocks from point A to point B. That's bad enough, but with Marvel Zone's Act 3 vertical level design, making mistakes near the top can send you all the way back down. Didn't like the slow ass blocks the first time? Enjoy having to do it the second or third time after falling. Spring Young Soul brings back the pacing and decent level design. Real quick, I wanna say I was slapping my ass off when I first saw the cope sign. I legit forgot that was there, and I just. I just love these armadillo enemies here. They just pull up and be like, Hey, where is you from, cuz? It's more platform heavy compared to Green Hill, but I bulk of this change. It has some creative bits in its level design, such as these U-shaped tubes. There are these spike balls that hover around them in such a way that tests your platforming building at this stage of the game. Definitely a step up from the previous zone's platforming sections. <laughs> Labyrinth zone. The water level. It's a pain in the ass. It's so slow. Too f***ing slow. During the development of this game, Yuchi Naga had a brain fart and thought hedgehogs can't swim. In actuality, they can't swim. What I'm trying to say is that this nigga can't swim! You have to walk most of the time. It's underwater. Sonic can't stay underwater for too long. If you do, you'll start to drown. They'll play this foreboding music. You see these bubbles coming out of the floor? Make sure to grab them so you won't drown. There's also spikes. Spikes are everywhere along with enemies, and these enemies either jump at you or place at spots where it feels like they're stalling for you to drown. That's a morbid level so fucked up, actually. What the hell? Wanna hear something even funnier? This was originally going to be the second level of the game. Ain't that some sh Imagine that you were having fun after finishing the promising Green Hill Zone, then bam, depression. I've always hated this zone as a kid. Starlight Zone is rather okay. It's fast, but it's rather weak on its level design side. It's not a bad zone, but there's really nothing noteworthy to talk about except the boss fight and the music, which I'll dive into in a moment. Scrap Brain Zone is the toughest level in the game. Remember how I said that Labyrinth Zone has a lot of things that'll kill you? There's also spikes, spikes are everywhere. Scrap Brain Zone has the worst. I'm talking fire, saw blades, bottleless pits, it got some Mega Man influence in this bitch and has disappearing blocks. But it's not as bad compared to Mega Man. You are a worthless bitch ass nigga. 
This show is really reflex heavy and so satisfying, and I really mean intoxicating to breeze through parts of this level so fast and gracefully. Sadly, it goes down from here. Look at you, Scrap Brain Stone Act 3. Act 3 is ass. Fuck, it might as well have been Labyrinth Stone Act 4. Granted, it's not as long as any of the previous acts. It's quite annoying to travel through a recolor of a zone that I do not like at all. Pro tip, you take Sonic's middle to heart and keep going fast at the start, you can take a shortcut that will put you right by the end of the act. Good riddance. The bosses are easy and not particularly notable either, except for Labyrinth Soda Starlight Zone bosses. For Labyrinth Soda, you have to chase robotic through this shaft with spikes pouring out at you and these statues spitting fire. Sounds fine, right? Did I mention that the water level rises and there's no air bubbles? No? Well, I guess you better get to stepping then. Please don't die here, there may be a checkpoint, but when you have to do the climb again, you have to do it with no rings. For Starlight Zone, you have these seesaws to bounce these bombs back or catapult yourself to Dr. Robotnik. It's a fun and creative boss fight. The final boss is pathetic. Yeah, you have no rings, but keep dodging these orbs and figure out where Robotnik is, then BAM! You completed Sonic the Hedgehog. So with all that being said, Sonic the Hedgehog has some ups and downs, such as the dramatic change in level pacing, which is my biggest issue. For glitches, I can account for one instance, which is the spike bug. You're supposed to get hit once, not with a two or three piece. There are no safe slots, but with modern collections, you have safe states. If you're not going for the emeralds, it's not too bad since the game was built around it. The dev team designed these levels with repetition in mind so you can find a faster route and get back to where you left off. That's also the main reason to replay this game or any other game in this franchise, to get faster and faster, improving your times so and trying to find that line. Sonic the Hedgehog looks good for a 1991 release. Each zone has variety and nice little details, like Green Hill Zone's waterfalls, Spring Yard Zone's tile sets have some nice lighting, and Scrap Brain Zone's background. If you play Sonic 1 on a CRT with a composite video, some details really pop out. The music is great, so who the fuck does not know Green Hill Zone's theme? If you raise your hand or said I do, then clearly you're a fucking liar, fake, and a fraud. How do you sleep at night? Masato Nakamura from the J-pop band Dreams Come True composed the soundtrack. Nakamura first created the tracks with real instruments, then the dev team digitized it for the Sega Genesis. So what used to sound like this... Now sounds like this. The tracks fit their levels' respective themes. My favorite tracks are Green Hill Zone, Spring Yard Zone, Starlight Zone, and Scrap Brain Zone. Green Hill Zone has this sense of adventure with its tune. It's really good stuff. Spring Yard Zone is really jazzy, and as a person who loves jazz, I mean, like, come on, it's, it's jazz. Starlight Zone sounds like a city pop joint. The intro of Starlight Zone even sounds derived from Bobby Caldwell's level weight. And Scrap Brain Zone has this sense of danger. For a 1991 release, Song the Hedgehog 1 still looks great and it holds up rather well today. This is a new segment that I'm introducing. This segment only applies to games that have multiple ports and re-releases. Sonic the Hedgehog has been ported and re-released onto many platforms. Throughout the video, I was playing with the original card in Sega Genesis, but there is Sonic Jam on the Sega Saturn, Sonic Mega Collection on GameCube, Xbox, PlayStation 2, and PC, Sonic Ultimate Genesis Collection on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, Sega Mega Drive and Genesis Classics on PC, Nintendo Switch, and last generation of consoles as well. Lastly, there are the remasters by Christian Whitehead and Simon Tomley, aka Stealth. The remaster runs at a higher resolution with true 16x9 aspect ratio, not this garbage, has better physics, and also tweaks in the visual presentation and audio departments, such as the special stage using real rotation in the music being remastered.
You can also play as other characters such as Tails and Knuckles. This is the definitive version of Sonic the Hedgehog. You can find it on your phone's app store and this version is included with Sonic Origins. There is a way to natively port the phone version on PC. I will show you how but that's out of this video's scope. I'll link Red Hot Sonic's video in the description in the comments below. In conclusion, Sonic the Hedgehog is a good game in some areas, it hasn't aged well, and you can tell that this is the first game in the series. But overall, it's still good. It gets a C rank. The pacing is what holds the game back, and I've been spoiled by later and better games of the franchise. Thanks for watching, check out my socials in the description, and what are your thoughts on the first Sonic game? What is your favorite Sonic game? Let me know in the comments. Have a very blessed day. See ya.